living in groups. Hey, Z, look what I've got. Dirt. And ants. You know, a lot of people think ants are just a bunch of bugs that turn up at picnics. But there's really a lot more to know about them. So I'm going to set up an ant colony. Great, Stephanie. But in an ant colony, there are different types of ants that do different jobs. And you've only got one kind of ant here. What do you mean? Well, all I see are workers. You don't have a queen ant here. Mm. Queen ants are bigger and they're a different shape. They have crowns on their heads, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Look, the important thing is, without a queen, there is no colony. This is a queen ant digging a nest for a new colony. She will lay thousands of eggs, giving birth to all the other members of the colony. Her job is to lay eggs. These are worker ants. They nurse the young, maintain the nest, go out looking for food, and take care of the queen. She's the big one in the middle. The ants that do one specific job are called a cast. And each cast is a very different shape and size. Together they build, maintain, and defend the colony. Ants aren't the only insects that live this way. So do termites. They build huge nests. Here's the queen. You certainly wouldn't confuse her with any other cast of termite. Bees live in complex societies too, with queens and workers and other castes. This is a worker bee. One thing workers do is go out and gather food. They have special tongues to suck nectar and hairs on their legs that collect pollen from flowers. No other bee cast has these special features. And there's another thing worker bees are specialized to do. Mark found out about it. He's with Robert Dahl of Princeton University. Yeah, I've got about 2,000 bees right here in an observation hive. Now, what is it you're trying to do here? Well, we're trying to figure out how the bees communicate with one another. Hey, Mark, this is the hive entrance where the bees uh, leave and return uh, on the field uh, with their food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we number uh, usually about 100 bees in the hive so we can tell individuals apart. We can follow one of these bees out to uh, the feeder we have set up. Now, how far will they go to find a flower? Well, it depends on the different races of honeybees, but uh, the kind that we use, the Italian race, will go, oh, I would say within five miles. This is the feeder that we've set out um, for our bees from our hive to forage at. Mm -hmm. We set it out so that we know what distance and what direction they're going. Doesn't look much like a flower to me, but they seem to be happy with it. Now, what do you have inside of the bottle? Oh, uh, that's... Uh, Sugar water, just regular sugar mixed with water. It's a lot more concentrated than most uh, nectar that they would get from flowers. Mm -hmm. About five times as concentrated. Mm -hmm. uh, how long will they feed here? Oh, they'll only stay here about 30 seconds, perhaps as long as a minute, and they'll fill up completely with uh, the sugar water, and then they'll head straight back to the hive. And while they're back at the hive, they'll tell the other bees where the food is so they can come out and get some too. How? Well, let's go see. Well, here are some of the bees that were out at the feeder coming back into the hive to bring back the food and tell the other bees where to go to find it. It's difficult, but the way the bees do it is to perform a little dance, which the other bees watch. And uh, as a matter of fact, here's one right here. If you look a little closer, you can see that the bee is uh, waggling her entire body as she cuts up here to the left and then she turns around oh, yeah. follows the same line over again see that uh-huh and you'll see that there are other bees which are following the dance and they're getting the information out of the dance to tell which way to go to get to the food source 
Now, how does that wiggling tell the rest of the bees where the food source is? There are two things that the bee has to communicate to the other bees. Uh, one of them is the direction to go in, and the other is how far to go. So you'll see that the bee, when she does this little waggle run, mm -hmm. she, she'll do it time after time in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And that direction tells the other bees the direction to fly in. And in this case, you can see the bees are dancing around, oh, let's say, 45 degrees or so to the left. And so the bees that are watching the dance will go out and they see the sun and they'll fly just that amount to the left of the sun. Okay, so that tells them which direction to go in. And the way they tell how far to go is by counting the number of times that the bees waggle their abdomen back and forth. Ah. See, uh, in this race of honeybees, each waggle corresponds to about 25 yards. So they'll count, uh, I guess in this case, say 16 waggles, which is about 400 yards. Mm -hmm. So what the bees will do after they've watched the dance is they'll head out, look for the sun, go 45 degrees to the left of the sun, mm -hmm. then they'll fly 400 yards and start looking around for a food source. How accurate is that? Are they going to come right to the food? Well, flowers tend to exist in fairly large patches. So there is some slop in the dance. That is, they aren't exactly 45 degrees and they aren't exactly 16 uh, waggles each time. Sometimes it'll be 15, sometimes 18, back and forth like that. So that any bee that is watching um, has an idea of what area to look at rather than what exact spot. So she'll fly out, you know, do these little calculations, figure how many degrees, how far to go, and then she flies out there and looks around in that general area. It's hard to count those waggles, though. I'd have to be a bee to do that. Yeah. Ants and bees live in such complex societies. What about other animals? Do they live in groups like that? Most animals don't live in groups at all. They're loners. Oh yeah, bears live alone. And tigers. But some animals do live in groups, like wildebeest that just all hang out together in a herd. Some fish hang out together too, in schools. <coughs> then there are animals that live in groups almost like a family, where each member has a relationship with the other members, like elephants. Or baboons. <coughs> This is Ambaseli National Park in southern Kenya. It's just after dawn and lots of animals are on the move. They're looking for food and water on the hot plains. Many mammals live here. Most are social animals. That means they live in groups. There's real safety in numbers. It's harder to get caught by animals that hunt if you're part of a very big group. But you have to learn to live with lots of other animals. And that's not always so easy. In fact, scientists come here to study a process called socialization. How animals learn to live together. Jean Altman comes to Kenya several times a year, all the way from Chicago, where she's a teacher. She studies a kind of monkey, the baboon. Baboons live in big families. The problem is that if you're a young baboon, you have to get along with all the other baboons in your family. That's what Jean and her assistants are studying how baby baboons learn to live with the rest of their group. Baboons spend their nights in trees. It's safer than sleeping on the ground where predators like lions and leopards could catch them in the dark. But the first thing they do after waking up is to climb down to eat. Jean, I think I counted about 45 
Is this a big group? A little larger than usual, but not, not really huge. Sometimes groups get a lot larger. There's some groups that are as small as eight or 10. That's unusual. And then some that can get over 100. Around 40, 50 is mm. about an average. Mm -hmm. And you've got everything from real little kids that like we, we see bouncing around to other animals that are about 18, 19, 20, 20 mm -hmm. years old, all in the same group. What's your purpose in being out here? I mean, besides Why? enjoying it? <laughs> Why have you spent your days watching baboons? Well, it's a real puzzle. We want to understand what their environment is, what their social environment is, what their, their foods and the weather and, and the other things they're confronted with, and then learn how they face those, that environment, how they deal with it, how well they cope. After eating near the trees, the baboons head out to other parts of their home range. Tom, let's move off after them. They're moving quite rapidly now. Why are they moving off so quickly? One minute they seem to be eating and foraging and okay and settled, and the next they're moving, they're off. Somebody seems to just get up and decide to go, and you sometimes it's one animal and sometimes another, and you think that they're just all doing their own thing. but. When one gets up and, and goes, often all the others will get up and go too. And they'll go from seeming to be all independent to the whole group moving together. Do they follow one particular individual? No, not regularly. Although when there's some really tense uh, decision time, sometimes one of the elderly females seems to be the one that's followed. Other times, it can seem to be an adult male or an adult female. Sometimes even some of the youngsters will finish feeding and, and moving out first. Mammals have a lot to learn, and they have a long childhood in which to do it. And like human children, young baboons learn not just from their parents and adults, but from other baboons the same age. That sometimes means learning the ropes the hard way. At the end of the day, all the baboons head toward the trees where they'll spend the night. You know, they've had a really long day. They've uh -huh. been feeding for most of the day, walking several miles, and they're really tired now. They're heading for this grove of trees where they'll spend the night. Is this their home? Do they always come back to these trees? Well, not just to these trees. They have about a dozen places that they go to, and this is just one of them. But it is one of their favorites, and it's rather nice right now because they do also have food in these trees. So they'll do a little feeding, and then they'll go to sleep for the night. Uh, well, they sure have good timing because I'm feet too. <laughs> right, uh. me too. Most animals live alone, but lots of animals live in groups. In insect societies, the different castes do different jobs. For instance, worker bees can tell other worker bees where to find food. Some animals live in groups where each member has a relationship with the other members. Young baboons have to learn how to get along in their group. One Classroom Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.